I'm looking at Psalm 33. Psalm 33, in verse 1. And I'm going to talk about how the Almighty is the reason for every season. He's the reason for everything. Look at verse 1. It says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp, singing to him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. So the Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, He's the reason for, number one, harps and instruments. It says, praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. It said, rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. So music and singing, the primary purpose of it is to praise. Verse 1. To praise the Lord. And this is comely for the upright. Comely. That means it's it's becoming. It suits. It makes sense for the upright to praise the Lord. It's comely for them. It suits them. The upright and the righteous. If you're a born again believer, you are righteous. You have been declared righteous. You've been justified by the Lord. When God looks at you, since you're saved, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees you as righteous. He sees you as upright in the sense of your spiritual state. So he says, rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous. Praise is comely for the upright. Now in the Old Testament, they hadn't been born again. They didn't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They lived according to the law as best they could, and then offered the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it, that's how they would be considered temporarily righteous in the sight of God. But me and you were always righteous in the sight of the God, in the sight of God if we're saved. You're always considered upright in the sight of God if you're saved. Now, your day-to-day -day walk is a lot different. Your state's a lot different. Your state has to do with how you're living at any given moment. There are times when you aren't righteous there's times when you're not upright when you're not trying to do nothing for god at all not trying to live for him at all then when it comes to your state you're not righteous or upright but when it comes to your standing you're always righteous and you're always upright and you always need to praise the lord we always need to rejoice in the lord so praise is comely for the upright and look at Verse 1 again, it says, Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. It says in Psalm 28, 7, My heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise Him. What's the reason for music? What's the reason for the harps and instruments? It's for the Lord. That's its primary purpose, to praise the Lord. If you don't know what to rejoice in, just rejoice in the fact that you're in the Lord and the Lord's in you. Rejoice in the Lord, it says in Psalm 33, 1. You can do that literally. Rejoice in the Lord because you're literally in the Lord. You're in Him and He's in you. Philippians 4, 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Now, look at Ephesians five nineteen. Ephesians 5, 19, it says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You see that it said, speaking to yourself in psalms. And this is Ephesians right there in the Pauline epistles. The Church of Christ says we shouldn't use instruments to worship. We shouldn't use a harp or a a guitar, or any type of instrument, a piano. But this says, speaking to yourselves in psalms. And in the psalms, what did it say in Psalm 33? Praise the Lord with harp, singing to him with the psaltery, an instrument of ten strings. So if we can speak to ourselves in psalms, and psalm says to 
use these instruments. Obviously, it's okay for us to use instruments and worship. And, you know, they say, well, you can't use instruments because Paul, uh, Paul or the New Testament doesn't say to use instruments. Yeah, but the New Testament doesn't say to use pulpits. It doesn't say to use pews. It, it doesn't say to even have a church building that you gather together in. They were meeting in people's houses. So, just because it doesn't say to specifically uh, use an instrument in the New Testament doesn't mean that you can't use one. And if we should speak to ourselves in Psalms, in Psalms it says to use instruments. Colossians 3.16, look at it. Same thing going on. Colossians 3 and verse 16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms. You saw it again in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So you can use instruments. So if we're to worship in psalms, the stringed instruments are for today. And the church building you're meeting at is not more holy and sanctified because you don't use instruments. I mean, you, you say that there's no instruments in the New Testament. Well, look at Revelation 5.8. It says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps. They had harps. Is your church building more set apart, more sanctified than heaven is? Now look at Revelation 14.2. Revelation 14, 2, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Look at Revelation 15, 2. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with, with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark uh, and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. When they praise God in the third heaven, they have instruments. Is your church building more sanctified than heaven itself? That's what you're teaching when you say that it's such a sin to have instruments in worship. So you can have instruments. Add instruments. You can use that for a new song. So he said in verse 3, Psalm 33, 3, he said, Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. So your harps and instruments, you can use those in your new song. Don't let it get old. Don't let the songs get old. A lot of people just, they sing the same songs. They let them get old and then they're just going through the motions singing the same songs. It's okay to sing the same songs as long as you don't let it get old. Don't go through the motions with it. And over and over you see a new song. The Lord is the only one that can give you something new because there's no new thing under the sun. If you want something new, you got to go to the Lord to get it. In Psalm 40 and verse 3, it says, And he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praising to our God, many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Isaiah 42.10 in Isaiah 42 and verse 10, it says, Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise from the end of the earth, ye that go down to the sea, and all that is therein, the isles and the inhabitants thereof. Revelation 5, 9. Revelation 5 and verse 9 says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. See, their new song had to do with the Lord being worthy, how he opened the seals, how he was slain for them, shedding his blood, redeemed them. It's all about rejoicing in him, giving praise in him, because it's comely, it matches, it meets, it's it's becoming of, it suits the upright. It's comely for the upright. Revelation 14.3. Revelation 14.3. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne. 
and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. Those hundred and forty-four thousand had their own special song. And you can have your own special song that's, that's just between you and God. Make your own little special song between you and God that maybe you, you, only you and Him know. And maybe that's something you do by yourself. And that's when you're truly uh, praising, worshiping God in sincerity and truth and it's genuine is because, you know, it's just you and Him knowing about it. Maybe nobody else sees it. It's just you and him knowing about it. And the only reason you're doing it is for him and not for anybody else or not, not for yourself. It's you and him. You can make a new special song. So back there in uh, Psalm 33 and verse 3, Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. So skillfully. You know, a lot of people get skilled in certain things. Get skilled in the right things. It's like in Hebrews 5.13. It talks about being skilled in the scriptures. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of God, for he is a babe. So you want to get skillful in the word. Get skillful in the things that matter. Get skillful in praise. That's something that really matters. You know, you got a lot of people that's skillful in a sport. They're skillful at their job. But get skilled in the right things. With your harps and instruments. You could get skillful in that. I don't know any instruments. And I should have learned to play some instruments. That would have been a beneficial thing. And if you got the talent to play those harps and instruments. You can make a new song. You can play skillfully. You can uh, sing of his words and his works. Sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud noise, for the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. That's what the songs could be about, his word and his works. Uh, these are right. His words are right. His works are right. No matter who tries to say otherwise. You know, you're going to have people that try to tell you otherwise, that the words aren't right, and that his works aren't right. They'll say his words got errors in it. They'll say his works are unfair. And that he didn't make things perfect or that his word is imperfect. But that's not true. Let God be true, but every man a liar. His word is right. It's perfect. And all his works are done in truth. Why well, believe a man who says it's wrong when the word of God itself says it's right? So sing about his words, sing about his works, sing about a coming world of goodness. Verse 5, he loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord, especially in the millennium it will be. When he's ruling in Jerusalem on the throne where everybody can see him, the earth will be full of the goodness of the Lord. And you can look look around the earth now and you can see the goodness of the Lord. He maketh the rain to, to come on the just and on the unjust. He makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. You know, you look at the animals, you look at the creation, it's full of his goodness. It's man that's brought anything bad that you see in it. Look at Isaiah 32, 1. In Isaiah 32... In verse 1, it says, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. When he's on the throne, he's going to rule in righteousness. He's going to reign in righteousness. It's going to be full of the goodness of the Lord. So he's the reason for harps and instruments. He loveth righteousness and judgment. He wants you to be righteous. He wants you to make proper judgments. He wants you to uh, approve things that are more excellent. He's the reason for harps and instruments. He's the reason for the heavens above. Look at Psalm 33, 6. It says, By the Lord, by the word of the Lord, were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. 
So he's the reason for the heavens above. <clears throat> they were made by his word. Look at Genesis 1 and verse 1. Genesis 1. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I look at verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. All God has, had to do was say it. And it was there. He said it and it showed up. The heavens were made by his mouth. He's the reason for the heavens above. You look around, you see the trees, you see the sun, you see the moon, you see the stars. He is the reason that every bit of that is there. He's the reason why you're here. The heavens were made by his word. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Look at John 1, 1 through 3. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the word, and the word, this is capital W, word, was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So the word is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's the creator, and he made it by his word. They were made by his word, the heavens above. You think about the breath. It talked about his breath. Look at Genesis 2 and verse 7. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So the reason you're here is because of the breath of the Lord. And what did it say back there in Psalm 33, 6? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. The heavens were made because of his words. The host of heaven, that would be the sun, the moon, the stars, the angels, were because of the breath of his mouth. When he made Adam and Eve, when he made Adam, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The first breath that man ever took came from the breath of God. And you're still living off that breath that started back there in Genesis. So he's the reason for the heavens above. He's the reason for the host of them. He's the reason for the host of heaven. He's the reason for the heavens above. Look at uh, some more verses. Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah 10, 11 through 12. Thus shall you say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. you got a lot of gods out there, little g-gods, that have not made the heavens and the earth. There's one God that made the heavens. Jeremiah 10, 12. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he utter, uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Look at Jeremiah. Or now look at... Isaiah 42, 5. Isaiah 42 and verse 5. Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. He's the reason you can put your hand to your mouth and you can feel that breath. Do that. That breath came from God. Look at Colossians 1, 16 through 17. Colossians 1, 16 through 17. It says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things are created by him and for him, and he is before all things. And by him all things consist. He's the only reason it's here. He's the only reason it's staying here. Look at Hebrews 1, 3. Hebrews 1 and verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, 
when he had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The Lord Jesus Christ, upholding all things by the word of his power, the same word that put them there in the, be in the beginning. So he's, your, he's the reason for the heavens above. He's the reason for the host of them. So it said, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. What's the host of them? Look at Deuteronomy 4 and verse 19. It says, Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. You see, man wants to take the things that God made and turn those things into God's. They want to look at the sun and then worship the sun. They want to look at an animal, worship the animal. They want to look at a wooden statue. God made the trees that the wood came from. They want to worship that. But you see, the, the host of heaven, it's not to be worshipped. The host of heaven, which this verse describes as the sun, moon, and the stars, that is part of the creation. It's not to be worshipped. He's the reason that it's there. The angels are the host of heaven. He's the reason they're there. The angels, the cherubims, the seraphims. He's the reason they're there. But all things are created by him and for him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Why would you worship the creation? Why wouldn't you worship the creator? So he's the reason for the heavens above. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Look at verse 7. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. So he's the reason for the heavens above. He's the reason for the host of them. He's the reason for the heaps of waters. That's above and below. You see, the, on, the waters in the oceans isn't the only waters he's responsible for. There's more waters. Look at Psalm 148. Psalm 148 and verse 4. It says, Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. So there's waters above, there's waters below. That's because of that flood back there in Genesis 1-1. Between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, God had to flood out the universe because of Lucifer's sin. This was a flood before Noah's flood. And it caused there to be water above and below. And you don't just have the waters on the earth in the oceans. you got a body of water up there above the second heaven. And remember, there's three heavens. you got a, a water above the second heaven. And he's the reason for it. He's the re who, who else do you know has that much power to contain such a body of water? Now, look, let me show you about these three heavens. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 2. 2 Corinthians 12, 2, it says, uh, Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such in one caught up to the third heaven. So there's three heavens. Paul got called up to the third heaven. That's where God's at. The heaven, when you say somebody died and went to heaven, that's the third heaven where Paul got caught up to it. John got caught up to it. Revelation 4. So that's the third heaven. Look at Genesis 1.20. Genesis 1 and verse 20 says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So you got fowls that fly in the open firmament of heaven. That's referring to the heaven as in our atmosphere. You look up and you see the birds flying. That's the first heaven. God made that. Now I'm going to show you the second heaven. That would be, look at Genesis 1.14. It says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So he said the 
you know, where he put the sun and the moon and the stars, that's heaven. That's the second heaven. So you got the first heaven where the birds fly, where the fowls are flying. You got the second heaven where he put the two great lights and the stars. That's what you call outer space. And then you got the third heaven where Paul got called up to. And then in Psalm 148, 4, it says, Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. So you know there's not just water on the earth. There's water above at least two heavens. Above the first heaven, which is where the birds fly, and the second heaven, where the stars are. Because it said, ye waters that be above the heavens, plural. So you know there's a heap of water above the second heaven, outer space. I told this to one guy, and he said, that's just a bunch of hippie stuff. Well, no, this is, this is a bunch of Bible stuff. You just, you're so, your mind's so clogged up from fantasy movie stuff that you think anything that's wild is just fantasy. But, but no, there's, there's all kinds of wild stuff in the Bible that you just don't know about. And let's look at some more verses about it. You think about that sea of glass. You've heard, I know you've heard about the sea of glass. And see above, above that body of water that's above the second heaven, you got that sea of glass. Sea of glass, Revelation 4, 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Revelation 15, 2. And I, was, and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. So you got the sea of glass up there in the third heaven where God's throne's sitting on. And under that, you got that heap of great waters. And <clears throat> that's there. The reason that's there is because God himself flooded out the original creation with a flood. And that's where Leviathan is in Job 41. You read about Leviathan. He's in those deeps. So the Lord's the reason for the heavens above. He's the reason for the host of them. He's the reason for the heaps of waters above and below. And he handles them effortlessly. You think about how easy it is for God to take these heaps of great waters and handle them effortlessly. Just like the Red Sea crossing. They said back there in Exodus 15, 8, it says, And with the blast of thy nostrils... The waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as an heap. And the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. He, he's the reason for the Red Sea crossing. Because he can handle the waters effortlessly. He's the reason for the crossing of Jordan over there in the book of Joshua. Joshua 3, 13. It says, And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above and they shall stand upon an heap see that word again heap then you think about elijah and elijah remember what they did over over there in second kings chapter 2 and verse 8 it says and elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters and they were divided hither and thither so that they too went over on dry ground Elijah took his mantle, smacked the waters, and they stood up on a heap. You think that's because Elijah was really strong? No, it's because Elijah served a God who's really strong. Uh, 2 Kings 2, 14. And he took the mantle of Elijah. This is Elijah now. That fell, He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. It's not because Elijah was strong. It's not because Elijah was strong. It's because the Lord God of Elijah is strong. He can handle the waters effortlessly. Then you think about Psalm 33, verse 7. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. So what's that all about? He layeth up the depth, depth in storehouses. Amos 9.6. Amos 9.6. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. He can take those that heap of great waters up there above the second heaven, and do anything with it that he wants. 
And that's what he did uh, in Noah's flood. He took some of that great water and flooded the whole earth with it. He can do anything he wants. He, he keeps it in storehouses. He can hold it together. And then it says back there in Psalm 33, 8, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. That's the next thing. He's the reason. He himself is the reason to hold him in high regard. Nobody earned it for him. He's the reason himself that you hold him in high regard. And you fear him. The fear of the Lord's the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord's the beginning of wisdom. And, and in the millennium, it will be the wisest time in man's history because Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord, is the beginning of knowledge. And the fear of the Lord is going to be all over the land. He himself is the reason to hold him in high regard. He earned it. And he's the, he's the reason that the heathen come to naught. Verse 10, The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. Of none effect. You see, the devil, any, any device that the devil or the devils or the antichrist comes up with in the tribulation, it's not going to prosper. Any device he's got to make sure you're buying and selling with the mark of the beast or to make sure you're in allegiance to him, all those devices are going to come to naught. Their counsels and their plans are going to fail. And they they got their cons plans. There's conspiracy across the world against the Lord and against his anointed. Psalm 2, 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. All that's coming to naught. He's the reason that the heathen are going to come to naught. It said back there in Psalm 33, 11, Psalm 33, 10, the Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen, the counsel, they take counsel together against him. He bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices, anything they come up with, of none effect. And then it says in verse 11, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. So his counsel stands forever. And he's the reason for that. Because he makes it stand forever. Look at 1 Peter 1.25. 1 Peter 1 and verse 25 says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. It's the word that stands forever. Man's word fails. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Man says a lot of things. Man fails all the time. God never fails. His counsel stands forever. The Lord's counsel. Because his, his counsel, his words, it's the heart of God on paper. Your King James Bible. It's the thoughts of his heart on paper. That's what you got if you got the word of God. And you neglect it. It says in verse 11, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. And he preserves them to all generations. You've got it in your lap right now. God's mind on paper. The thoughts of his heart on paper. This is God's heart on paper. So, hold him in high regard. He's the reason you hold him in high regard. He earned it. He makes the heathen come to naught. His counsel stands forever. The heart of God on paper. And next thing, Hamas can't hang. It says in verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And the people whom he hath chosen for his inheritance, not Hamas, Israel. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's Israel, not Hamas. Hamas, they're headed for hell. Psalm 9, 17. Psalm 9, 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Israel is his inheritance. Psalm 78, 71. Psalm 78, 71. From following the ewes great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. That's his inheritance. 
So back in Psalm 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. And a nation that tries to serve God, they're blessed, but when it comes right down to it, this is talking about Israel. And Hamas can't hang. All right, the next thing. He's the reason for the habitation of eternity. Look at verse 13, Psalm 33, 13 and 14. The Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He's the reason for the habitation of eternity. God is eternal. Without him, there could be no eternity. In Isaiah 57, 15, it says, the, He's the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. See, without him, there's no eternal life. Without him, there's no eternity for you to go to and have eternal life. <clears throat> He's responsible for the habitation of eternity, and heaven sees all. He sees it all from up there in the third heaven. In eternity, the Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. He see it's not the Lord that's, or it's not Santa that sees you when you're sleeping and knows when you're awake and knows when you've been bad or good. It's not him that's making a list and checking it twice. It's the Lord that sees it all. Matthew 10, 26. Matthew 10 and verse 26. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. It's the Lord that sees it all. And he knows it all. And nothing's covered to him. It's all revealed to him. He sees it all. You don't have anything. You don't have the Lord in the dark on anything. Look at Matthew 12. Matthew 12. 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof on the day of judgment. The Lord looketh from heaven. He hears it. He sees it. He sees everything that you're doing. He hears every word that you're saying. There's nothing going unnoticed. Look at Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Look at Romans 2.16. Romans 2.16. 16 says in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel he's up there in his habitation of eternity he's the reason for it and heaven sees all he sees all from heaven up there Psalm 33 In verse 15, He fashioneth their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. He considereth all their works because he sees it. But he's he fashioneth all their hearts alike. He, that's the next thing. He's the reason for the hearts of men. He created your heart. Your heart got a virus. Jeremiah 17, 9, It's deceitfully wicked of all, of all things. But he can give you a new one. You get saved. You get born again. You become a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. But he's responsible for your heart. Put your hand on your chest. You feel your heart beating. He's why your heart's beating. Take your hand. Put it on your kid's chest. You ever gave your, your kid a hug? You ever been tucking your, your kid in bed at night? And you give them a hug and you feel that heart beating. He's the reason their heart's beating. He's the reason your heart's beating. And the only thing that's keeping you from going to hell if you're not saved is God's keeping that heart beating. Only thing that's separating you from eternity right now is your God keeping your heart beating. He fashioneth their hearts alike. It says, God's the one that's responsible for the heart in your chest. He's the one responsible for keeping it going. He fashioneth all their hearts alike. He considereth all their works. God's the reason that there's a God-sized hole in your heart. God made every man with a hole in his heart that needs to be filled, and men are trying to fill it with everything else but God. There's 
celebrities and stuff, they got everything, and they say they got a God-sized hole in their heart that the, the riches of this world just can't fill. God is responsible. He's the reason for the hearts of men. The next thing, the next thing is, He is the hope for saints. He's your only chance. Verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy. He's your only chance because from Him comes true mercy. The eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him. You need to fear Him because He's the only way you can have mercy. He's your only chance. He's responsible. He's the reason for the hope, that you, any hope that you have. And think about this. The hosts of mighty men can't help. Look at verse 16. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host, a big great army that he has. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. You think back there in Second Chronicles 14, 9 through 12, those 1,000 thousand Ethiopians, those 1 million Ethiopians came against Asa. He had half as many soldiers. He wasn't delivered by the multitude of an host. He was delivered by the Lord himself. The hosts of mighty men can't help. The only hope for saints is the Lord God Almighty. The mighty men can't deliver. So hours in the gym profits little. You can't be delivered by much strength. It has to be the Lord. Horses can be fell off of. You think about horses. People put confidence in a lot of things. They would put confidence in horses. Men put confidence in their tanks and their machines and their uh, things like that. But you can't put confidence in horses. It says in verse 17, And horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. You can fall off of him. He can get spooked and knock you right off the horse. It's got to be the Lord that comes through and gives you mercy. He's the only hope for saints. For saints, you can the the horse can have the wrong rider. Revelation six two, that antichrist white horse rider. He's a fake. He's a counterfeit. You can't trust in him. Uh, many horses can't help you. Deuteronomy seventeen sixteen. He says, "Don't multiply horses, because that ends up hurting you." The only hope for saints is His holy name. Verse 21, For our heart shall rejoice in Him because we trusted in His holy name. Don't trust in horses. Don't trust in the hosts of many armies. Trust in Him. Trust in His holy name. He delivers from death. For our heart shall rejoice in Him because we trusted in His holy name. Let Thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we Hope in thee. He's the hope for saints. It said in verse 20, Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and shield, and our shield. Before that, it says, To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. He is, His holy name is the only thing that can deliver you from death. Revelation 6 8, one of those horses is death. The only thing that can deliver from Him is the Lord Himself. 1 Corinthians 15 26. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. He can deliver you from the famine. Revelation 6, 5, that famine's coming. You see, you need His mercy. Without Him, you have no hope. Without Him, there's no mercy. Death is coming. Famine is coming. Verse 16 said you can't trust in an host. Verse 17 said you can't trust in a horse. Verse 18 shows you you got to have hope in His mercy because He's the one that can deliver you from death and famine. Verse 19, so your soul should be waiting on the Lord. He is your help and your shield. Verse 21, trust in His holy name. Verse 22, hope in Him. He's the only one that's rich in mercy. Ephesians 2, 4. But God who is rich in mercy. Jesus Christ is the reason for every season. 